Hi, I'm Femi O.K. and you're in the stream. Today, the US, Cuba and the emotional embargo between them. How can Cuban Americans overcome their divide with the island? So no prizes for guessing what Cuban Americans and Cubans and even Americans are going to be talking about over the next couple of days. We've got a little jump on that conversation. Brian Malika Valau, what do you have on your laptop? Lots of conversation, but this is a comment from a Cuban American member of our community who okay. is uh, putting something out there that he wants us all to consider as we head into this conversation. So hey, have a listen. Uh, as important as it is and as great as it is that Cuba and United States relations are opening up, I think uh, we always need to consider uh, the betterment of the life of the Cuban people. And as long as their life is not getting better and progressing, uh, who is this really helping? Who is this helping? We'll get our guests' answers on that in today's show. We want your help. You can tweet us with hashtag AJStream. But remember, the show is only as strong as you, the community. So pitch us your ideas, share your thoughts, and you too could be in the stream. Hi, I'm Oscar Guardiola. I'm a Latin American writer and I am in the stream. The American flag will fly over the U.S. Embassy in Havana this week for the first time in half a century, easing a standoff that once brought the world to the edge of nuclear war. Relations may be normalizing, but the U.S. still has an embargo on the island. Feelings are raw on both sides of the Florida Strait. That's the stretch of water dividing families separated by Fidel Castro's communist revolution against what he calls U.S. imperialism. Many Cubans in the United States and on the island say they're all part of the same family, but understanding each other and getting along may be the hardest challenge ahead. With us to talk about this, we have Ana Rosa Quintana. She's an analyst with the policy group, The Heritage Foundation. DJ EFN is a music producer and filmmaker of the documentary series, Coming Home. And in Dallas, Texas, Ralph De La Cruz is a Cuban-born writer and retired journalist. So welcome, everybody. Hola. It's great to have you here. You. I, let me show you this beautiful black and white picture here on my laptop. Ralph, can you see it? What's going on here? Oh, this is Ralph it's here. <laughs> and we're in Cuba. Yes, the, what a beautiful uh, little boy. Second from the left. Yes, the here we have Ralph. Like just about to pee his pants. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. What's going on there, Ralph? Do, do you even remember? I mean, you left Cuba when you were four. What do you even remember of living there? I remember the things a four-year-old would. I remember yeah. our house. I remember the, the neighbors, the neighborhood. Uh, I also remember being very scared. Right. And uh, I remember a lot of turmoil. I remember my father being put into prison. I remember the night that we left on a little boat. Mm. Uh, things, the traumatic things that end up coming out in a child's memory. Sure. Uh, I didn't know the intricacies, the politics of what was going on, uh, but I had a lot of feelings and a lot of sense of the disruption in life. Yeah. Uh, that's a big part of what I remember. And certainly I remember my cousins and my two sisters. Yeah. I remember the, uh, uh, that photo. And uh, uh, they're happy memories, but a lot of trauma and a lot of fear. So, Anna, you were 17 when you went to Cuba. Yes. There's a, there's a story there about garlic that was kind of fascinating. Oh. Garlic, <laughs> garlic and beef. Made my mouth water. T t give us a lead up to that story because it's a fantastic story. Sure. So um, in Cuba, right, you have what's called like the local committees in defense of the revolution, the CDRs, mm. and that's kind of the Cuban government's um, local intelligence forces, right? There and and it's, they're essentially there to make sure that everybody's falling in line and being a good little communist and abiding by the revolution and whatnot. Um, so in Cuba, right, there's obviously there's tons of scarcity. There's tons of scarcity in the in within in 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 the supermarkets and things like that. So if let's say somebody is cooking something that they bought off the black market. Like I was telling um, Adam, one of your producers, the story that my um, and my grandmother had been cooking, um, had been cooking beef at one point, and it was something that she didn't purchase in the store. You just you bought it from somebody, but since it wasn't from a government store, it wasn't necessarily okay to have done so. Mm -hmm. So what you do is you burn garlic, so then the neighbors don't smell the beef because if the neighbors yeah. smell the beef, they know, hey, the local store is not carrying any beef. How were you mm -hmm. able to get a hold of that? Mm. 
Interesting. Uh, so imagine a life like that, right? Imagine you. there is no sense of community. It's the sense of community was completely destroyed by the revolution and kind of these these CDRs and kind of this creating this, this collective idea of incentivizing people to kind of turn against one another. It's interesting because you're definitely not the only one who feels that. And I want to share this tweet from Barbara. She says, I was born in Cuba and I left at 17. I've lived outside for 27 years. I've never stopped thinking about my country and wanting its freedom since day one. My views are shaped by my memory. She says, Cuba lives in my heart. I dream of seeing it free, prospering in democracy with respect for human rights. So, Ethan, you were born here in the States. Correct. But did your parents have these same memories? And, and yes. did they mesh up with what happened when you actually went to Cuba for your Yourself? They definitely had the same memories. Um, I was raised in fear of ever going to Cuba. You know, you're, you're told you do not go to Cuba, you'd be contributing to the regime if you went there, and if you go there, you're going to get kidnapped or something's going to happen to you. So for a long time, I never even had the idea of going to Cuba. But as I got older, I realized I did want to explore, I wanted to see my parents' homeland, and in fact, I wanted to see it before things ever changed drastically. So I made that trip in 2012. And knowing that it's been time since they were there and since a lot of people had gone, um, things were different from what I was told. And in, in terms of what she was saying about the sense of community, I actually saw a sense of community where I went. Mind you, I didn't explore the entire island. I was in Havana, in the, in the outskirts of Havana. But that's something that I saw there that I, I don't even see sometimes in the United States, see, which think, was a sense of I think community. There's, there's a, there's, I watched a documentary and it was really enjoyable. There's a, a moment where you're doing a session, you're out in the boonies, mm -hmm. okay? There are no shops with, there's no food right. in the shops. Right. Your crew is super, super hungry and there's no food. Yep. And then there's somebody pops up who I call her, I've called her the spaghetti session girl. Yeah. But, but <laughs> pick up the story it, from it, there. It was really weird. There's, there was, no food. There was no food. No restaurants. We were on a mountain to eat. or something or a <laughs> yeah. large hill or somewhere. Yeah. Um, and yeah, my, we were all starving and there was this like, they have these little like stores in homes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And my friends like, we need to eat something. Yeah. Some of my friends were not Cuban American. They didn't care. They don't care about anything Cuba. They're like, I need to eat right now. The hell with what you're doing here culturally. So, so they looked for food and they found um, spaghetti, but dry spaghetti. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing we could do with dry spaghetti. And a young girl that was there in the neighborhood said, well, I'll, I'll make it for you. Yeah. And I wasn't there when that happened. And he, so apparently he bought two, two boxes, one for us and one for her. Yeah. And then he told me, he's like, oh, yeah, I'm waiting. This girl said she's going to make it. And I laughed at him. I said, you just got jacked for your money <laughs> or for your, for your dry noodles. Like, what's wrong right. with you? Right. And sure enough, this young girl comes out of like a shantytown area. And she, um, and she calls us in and we go in and she had plates set up, the spaghetti there, and they welcomed us. And it was really, it was heartbreaking because they had nothing. This was like, okay. they were literally living in tin. You know, it was, it was really crazy. See, we've got two food stories here. That was kind of <laughs> accidental. So we've got the beef and the burning the garlic. We've got <laughs> the spaghetti girl with the pasta. Yeah. These are opposite stories about the sense of community. You're saying your grandma was hiding the fact that she had got beef. Okay. You're saying that this stranger came up and cooked for you. Right. What's going on here? Well, I think these are these are it's the only common thing here is that it's yeah. about food. So I yeah. think we shouldn't confuse that. Yeah. And what I meant about the lack of community is you cannot have community if you don't have trust. I completely right. agree that the Cuban American, the Cuban community is very, we're friendly, right? We naturally get along, which is why you and I, when right. we met, we were just started talking because there's so many things that we have in common. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying in the sense of, 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 of that, that what, I was, what I was trying to get back to is the lack of trust that's been created between the people and the government, right? The people don't have any trust within the government. They don't have any trust that the government's gonna improve their lives. And then it's also but created- Anna, how do you know that? From where you live here in the states how do you know that people don't have trust in the government well because there's a lot of cubans that do come to the united states and a lot of people in the exile in the not, in, not just the exile community in the dissident community that i'm in contact with on a consistent basis mm. this is this is what it's what i do for work you know mm. it's I, I i work on latin america foreign policy and because cuba is in the forefront of it and because i am cuban american this is you know it's something that's always just been a priority of mine and that was true to my trip as well people do not have trust in the government in Cuba either. Yeah. So that was also true to, to my trip. Ralph? Although I would argue that uh, people don't have trust in the government here in the United States that, either. That can be argued um, well. I think it's almost a universal uh, reaction of humans these days. Um, I think that it's hard to generalize um, everybody in Cuba. I met a broad range of people when I was there in 2003. Uh, there are, there's a sense among some Cubans um, young Cubans 
have lived with Fidel Castro their whole lives. He's a combination to them of, of uh, Santa Claus and uh, George Washington. Huh. And uh, it doesn't matter what we think and what that we know he's a dictator and he's brutal and all these other things. He, the relationship that the Cuban people in Cuba have with the government, obviously they have big issues with it. It's an oppressive government. It's one that I think we all agree has to change. However, it's a more complicated relationship than I think that we generally believe. Uh, I think it's, it's um, uh, a situation where people have changed and adapted to that government over time. Um, and I think that ultimately they will be the ones who determine what direction the, the country goes in. But I think that we really have to, the establishment, the, more, the greater normalization of relations will allow that to happen. I think change ends up happening on a one-to-one -one basis, on an interpersonal relationship. The more that we, those of us who are here in the United States who are of Cuban heritage, communicate with the people there, just like as you have, Anna uh, and EFN, uh, the more we will be able to make those connections and mm -hmm. help create the real change that will ultimately change the government. We're yes. in a time of transition. But Ralph, it's interesting though this that you, you mentioned that complicated relationship, and so we're hearing from Cuban Americans on the complicated relationship that Cubans have with their government. I want to give you uh, also another view, also from a Cuban American, and it's interesting. It raises something that I thought was was kind of interesting. Um, this is Annalise. Anna, have a listen to this. Yeah. I think uh, the biggest misperception Cubans inside the island have about Cuban Americans and the exile community is based upon lies that the re regime has said throughout the years, that Cuban Americans are backwards, they're full of hate, they cannot let go, they cannot go through modern times, and also that they just want to go back to the country to take back the properties that were taken, to leave people out, out of their homes, and which is all a lie. So all of our guests were nodding their heads there at that video comment. But, but I'm wondering, you know, this is her view of what Cubans think of Cuban Americans. Do you think that the same could be said for Cubans talking about Cuban Americans, that their mind, mindsets are, are shaped by the political reality where they live, where you live? Abs absolutely. I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but absolutely. I couldn't agree more. EFN, you were talking about uh, your parents, uh, their view of what was going to happen to you. I had the same situation. When I went to Cuba, and it was to go do some work, my parents were, don't go, you'll never come back, they're oh. not going to let you out. And um, uh, when I got there, what I found instead, the, the man who looked at my passport said, welcome back, brother, in Spanish. Oh. Um, uh, people there were hungry to hear <clears throat> from those of us in the United States, because they know that they are receiving very lim limited information. They were so hungry. I went to a baseball game in uh, Santa Clara, and uh, uh, there were people wearing U.S. Army T-shirts, Notre Dame T-shirts. Um, everywhere I went, I went to see a baseball game um, um, just among kids in Matanzas. The kids stopped playing and came running over to where uh, I was with my photographer, and they wanted to talk about the Marlins. They're starving for this relationship. And I, for one, was very taken by it. And I was amazed at how much um, uh, the, the views of, of my parents uh, were colored uh, uh, and so different than what I encountered there. If I could, if I could jump in, it's, it's, you know, you're, you're right. The, your, your parents, who is both of what your parents said, it's, it was colored by their experiences because many Cuban, many Cuban exiles who have since gone back to the island didn't have such a warm welcome like how you had. They weren't, they weren't told, you know, welcome back, brother. When I flew back into Cuba, there was a separate line for Americans and there was a separate line for people who were of Cuban descent. And these people's suitcases were being opened up. Their clothing was taken out. There was one woman in particular, and this was absolutely heartbreaking. They were taking clothing out of her bag, putting it up against 
against her body and saying, all right, this is a man's shirt. This is clearly not for you. We're going to confiscate this. And that's exactly what they did to many people over and over again. So not everybody received that warm welcome. And, you know, kind of, Rafael, you brought up an amazing, amazing point. And this is something that I think needs to be stressed even further, that when there is a free and, a, and democratic Cuba, that any, that any transition or any political change that's going to happen on the island, it should happen by the terms of the Cuban people. That is something I firmly and 100% support. We need to put, put policies, and I'm saying this from the U.S. perspective, policies in place that empower the Cuban people to be able to make this choice. And it's never going to be done with this current government in place whatsoever. We clearly see this is the longest running military dictatorship for in, in the Western Hemisphere, right? They've been around for over half a century. And over half a century of their actions have clearly demonstrated they're not working in the interest of the Cuban people. So what can we do from our side over here, right, to make sure that the Cuban people have the tools, right, that they have the ability to transform their lives into, as to their terms? My, my question is, is that at what point do we say it's been too long, that, that things aren't changing, we've been trying to do something for so long? I mean, it's the, it's, it's the definition of insanity, you know, doing the same thing, getting the same results. And that's the problem that I've had with the embargo at this point. Like, I believed in it growing up, my parents, like everything politically, I understood it. But then once I started to open my eyes and look at history and look at, at the bigger picture, I'm like, it's not black and white, it's gray. And, and, and the only people suffering are the Cubans. On yeah. The no, no. I look. I, I exactly. agree. The only people are suffering on the island are are the Cuban are the Cubans, right? But we need to look at this. The embargo was put in place in 1961 as a response to the to the Cuban government's confiscation of U.S. property. Right. It was never put in place for regime change whatsoever. Has it throughout time been able to alter the behavior of the Cuban government? At times, has it resulted in regime change? Obviously not. I firmly, there's no, you can't argue that the, the embargo has resulted in regime change. The Cuban government is still in power. My question to you is, though, should we give up the last tool of leverage that we have, one? Two, there's a, over 100, there's, what, 190 countries that have open and warm relations with the Cuban government. So we clearly have 190 examples of engagement so, and commercial exchanges so as a failed strategy. Are those two questions for EFN? Well, actually, as to, to, the, to my both Cuban no, colleagues. I, yeah. <laughs> right. Well, right there, Anna, you said that it wasn't instituted for regime change, and yet now you're saying that it is, uh, uh, that it's the last tool of leverage we have for that. I never said for regime change, but I said it's the last tool of leverage for at least affecting behavior, for affecting the Cuban government's behavior, right? And that is something that I think I, we should never apologize for in any way that we want to have an effect on a government's behavior that denies its people the most basic human rights, that just last month alone conducted over 600 politically motivated arrests that beats dissidents without any regard and with impunity. That is something I but think we should obfuscate point. our moral responsibility on. I, I certainly agree we should not obfuscate our uh, moral responsibility. But again, it comes back to the issue of whether this really has had any impact. I think the greater impact would be once we start having more of a dialogue. You either believe in, in diplomacy or not. I believe in diplomacy. So we have not had a diplomatic solution to the Cuban problem uh, uh, for 53, 54 years, eight yeah. months. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't had that policy. Mm -hmm. We are about to finally have a policy of diplomacy. And I think that's the only way you really create change. We can hope that the embargo is some kind of leverage, but after 54 years, it has shown not to be a tool of leverage. It has shown to be a tool that has hurt the Cuban people, not the regime. The regime is stronger by it. When I was there, people were saying, the problem isn't the regime, the problem is the embargo. And when we start being seen as the problem instead of the solution, mm -hmm. I think that in itself is a problem. We, uh, we need to take away the excuse that we've been giving the Castro mm -hmm. brothers and let them stand on their own and, and have to face the people and deal with the fact that the lives of those people are a hundredfold worse than they were in 1959. No, Ralph, you the, stole the words right out of this person who <laughs> tweeted uh, yeah. their minds, really. This is what Connie said, that the embargo hasn't worked. He writes in, Cubans have paid the price for the embargo, and now it's time to unite Cubans, one Cuban for all. So we heard what, EF, uh, what Anna had to say and what Ralph had to say, EFN. You're nodding your head during some of this. What, what are you thinking about that? No, I'm agreeing with what he's saying, and, and I feel that, that the embargo has been used for all these decades as a scapegoat 
for the, for the Castro regime to say, it's not me, it's them. They're the ones starving you. They're the ones that are, that are not allowing things to come in and out of the country. It's not me. And, that's, and when I, this is the other, the other side of the story too. When I went to Cuba, one thing that, that I encountered talking to, and I, and I went, nothing political was strictly dealing with music, and I really didn't want to be even dealing with anything political at all. Um, and one thing they kept telling me is they're sick of talking about this. They're like, we just want life to get better. We don't care about Castro. We don't care about your government. We don't care about government stuff. We just want our life to get better, and we want to be able to exchange our ideas. We want to be able to get, in terms of artists that I dealt with, we want to get our music out. We want to get our art out, and that's all they care about. They're yeah. sick and done of this conversation back and forth of the government stuff. See, so EFN, there was something that, that, that stayed with me in the documentary. A lot of it was just that people getting together as a, as a, as a family that was separated. Right. But some of it was practical. As a Cuban-American, the luxuries that you have, the everyday facilities that you take for granted, well, they're not in many parts of Cuba. Right. So we're going to pick up this little story yeah. where you decide, or one of the team decides to use the bathroom, but it's not as easy as you might think it would be right. if, for instance, you were in Miami. So we're in the bathroom. Here's coming home. This is how you flush a toilet in Cuba. Okay, first things first. You have a bucket. You go to your, your stream. You wait. You just wait. That's it. If you find out that I took in his bathroom and I can't flush the toilet, he's gonna go crazy. And the ain't flushing, you know. So I gotta figure this out with this. <laughs> Whatever happens with the embargo, the travel, the travel restrictions are loosening up. More Cuban Americans will be able to go to Cuba. But Ralph, are they ready for that? Are they ready I for the slow internet and, and, and <laughs> slow plumbing? Oh, that's so funny. That's the exact same uh, experience that I had. Um, you know, the amazing thing to me about what's happening in Cuba is that for many years, people always thought that change would come like a powder keg, that it would be uh, a sea change all at once. The invading armada from South Florida, uh, <laughs> from the Cubans in South Florida. And you know what? It's been completely the opposite. It has been as slow a trickle as the water coming out of that shower. And um, uh, change is a process, and, and we're really seeing it in Cuba. And, for example, the Miami Herald had a great piece two days ago about they are now starting to see advertising in Cuba. And it's yeah. not the, it, it's kind of interesting because they bypass, for example, some of the things that we have had here traditionally in the U.S. Newspapers there practically don't, don't exist. So the way the advertising is happening apparently is on thumb drives. They put them on there, they, they give internet content on thumb drives and they exchange that. And, but it's amazing to me that there is now starting to be the beginning of advertising, which is at the very core of capitalism. So we're seeing these changes happening little by little, but we have to have the contact. That's how we can best direct policy in Cuba is by giving technology, by establishing relationships, and that's how real change will come about. But it's about as slow as the trickle of water, but it will come. Wow. We're almost out of time here. So, um, uh, Anna, you've been to Cuba, and uh, EFN, you've been to Cuba. One line of advice when people decide to go? Um, bring baby wipes and medicine, because mm -hmm. these are things that are not that readily available. And the bucket experience, I hope you have very strong forearms, because right. we all collectively laughed the moment <laughs> that we saw that bucket, because we all remember the bucket experiences. Right. And I think one thing, just, let's just, just to clarify one point that hasn't been made, Cuban Americans can travel to Cuba as, uh, as often as they'd like to. But All right, thank well. you very much. <laughs> so we've had here Anna Quintana, DJ EFN, Ralph De La Cruz. It's been a pleasure having this conversation thank with you. Cuban Americans. We are going to continue this conversation online right here at stream.aldazira.com in this new chapter of Cuban American history. Thanks for watching. <laughs>